to the 2334th meeting and the 83rd annual Joseph Henry Lecture. So it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Craig C. Mello. Craig is Howard Hughes Medical Institute Investigator, Blaze University Chair in Molecular Medicine, and Director of the RNA Therapeutics Institute at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. He is the co-recipient with Andy Fire of the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. They showed that double-stranded RNAs induce a sequence-specific reaction that silences expression of cognate cellular RNAs. Their work revealed an ancient gene regulatory mechanism of both plants and animals and opened the world of interfering RNA to scientists to explore the biological functions of RNAIs, the regulation of genes through RNAIs, disease processes involving RNAIs, and the possibility to design new therapeutics using RNA interference and the complex mechanisms through which it operates. Craig continues to work on gene silencing and embryogenesis using the nematode C. elegans at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And for those of you who don't know it, the fate map of all the cells in C. elegans have been determined as well as its complete genomic DNA sequence making it a wonderful, elegant subject for studying development. Craig earned a Bachelor in Science from Brown, a PhD from Harvard. He did postdoctoral work at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and he then joined the University of Massachusetts Medical School, where he still is carrying out his work. He is an author on a large body of scientific work and has received, I think, too many awards to mention here, in addition to the Nobel Prize. He's a member of the National Academies of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and perhaps most important of all, as of tonight, the Philosophical Society of Washington. He's also, I should mention, a local hero. He grew up here. He graduated from Fairfax High School. His dad and his mom are in the audience along with other family members, and we are absolutely delighted to have them here and to have had dinner with them. His dad, by the way, is also a scientist and he served as assistant director of the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. Craig's talk tonight is entitled, A Worm's Tail, Sequence of Evolution and Immortality. Please hold your questions to the end and the podium is now all Craig's. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I've got to come back next time just to see the rendition of my talk that she's going to give. That was really impressive. Uh, very, very, very impressive. Well, it's really it's an honor to be to be here and uh, and to join this society. Thank you very much. Um, and tonight, uh, it sounds like the last lecture was very technical. This lecture is not going to be quite that technical. I'm going to try to take you more uh, toward um, sort of the bigger picture and try to make some connections for you that I hope will uh, get you excited about genetics and genomics because there's a real incredible revolution going on right now. As all of you know, we now have the complete genome sequence of not only the nematode, which you just heard about, but also the human uh, and a growing number of different organisms. Um, we're learning a tremendous amount every single day about the genetic underlying causes of human disease, diseases that are devastating to uh, many of our family uh, members and loved ones. Uh, we're really, uh, I think, on the cusp, uh, on the verge of major breakthroughs in medicine that are going to come from this greater understanding of the genetics of disease. So we're learning a huge amount, and I'd like to share some of that with you tonight. Um, I uh, had the, the fortune of growing up with a strong connection, as you heard, to the Smithsonian. Um, my dad was a paleontologist there when I was a kid, and uh, it's, it was wonderful to go into the museum and get to see uh, the fossils laid out on the tables. and 
to learn about you know, the history of life as evidenced in the fossil history uh, of the earth. And so that was wonderful. I also had the fortune of having a mom interested in art, uh, trained as an artist in college uh, with uh, a great le level of curiosity and, and just love of the world. So I think I had a kind of the best of both worlds in, in my uh, parents and their interests. And that was a very important, I think, element for me in growing up. And of course, my brothers and sisters, uh, two of whom are here tonight, uh, had a big impact on me as well. Um, getting to uh, bounce ideas around the kitchen table was uh, really a really wonderful experience as well. Now, um, biology and the life sciences is, as I mentioned, in an absolute revolution. There's really, it seems like every time you turn around, there's a new incredible breakthrough. And my first slide is, you know, because I couldn't even put it to words, I'm going to let the worms sort of do their thing on the first slide, and I, it's, it's to music, so you can, lit, you can just sort of listen to this uh, music, and you can hear this uh, song, and, and sort of read along. And if I could have the lights down just a little bit, uh, I think it, you'll see what, what you're going to see are worms developing with uh, green fluorescent protein from jellyfish expressed at the junctions of each of their hypodermal cells. So it's, it's kind of faint, so we'll need the lights down even a little bit more up here at this end. Um, and there's a little bit of uh, writing, so you can just sort of read along as you go. Take me to the magic of the moment on the road. Some of you are probably laughing because you realize that that little thing that looked like a disco ball, that's a bubble in the Petri dish, and the worms are getting trapped in there, and there's like probably 15 worms caught in the bubble of, of auger in the, in the Petri dish. Um, so what you were just seeing was a jellyfish gene that is fused to a worm gene that makes the junctions between the hypodermal cells. So now that worm fluoresces the same way those jellyfish do by using this fluorescent protein from jellyfish. That allows biologists to look at living tissue and look at where proteins are going and what they're normally doing inside the cells. An incredible tool. And it actually also sort of connects me to, you know, why I got interested in, in biology. When I was a kid, I was actually much more interested in astronomy and the stars and stuff because I was growing up when people were walking on the moon and I thought, you know, someday I want to go up, you know, to planets and go out into outer space. But when I was um, in high school, I read in the newspaper that the human insulin gene had been cloned in bacteria and that they could now make human insulin and give it to patients, and that the bacteria could read the human genetic code and make insulin for humans. And I thought, that is powerful. Think of the things we could do if we could learn how to use that kind of approach to you know, correct genetic disease, for example, to make um, uh, you know, people who are born with genetic defects to, to fix the defects in their cells. And I, I just got really excited about biology. So 
after that, I, I switched paths and went into molecular biology. That's the kind of tool that you're seeing used there with that tag that's been added to a worm gene. That We call that DNA transformation. We take a piece of DNA from a jellyfish, fuse it to a worm gene, and then reintroduce it into the animal. And so what my, most of my talk is really going to be about is how information is handled and how it flows inside the cell. And I'm going to try to, I've had a lot of practice trying to describe my work to my family, and I really owe a lot of thanks to them. They're here tonight. They're getting another dose of it. How often do you get a chance to lecture to your mom and dad? <laughs> this is great. So um, this uh, slide is showing, I'll let the, you read that first. So this is the germline of a C. elegans uh, hermaphrodite. And what you're seeing here are uh, the germ nuclei. This is an ovary, so it's making eggs. And uh, if you read the little uh, text that came over here, um, germ, you know, this is, one, this is one of the fun things for me, because we have uh, John Mather, who's a cosmologist here in the, in the audience. And when we were in Stockholm together, we both received the Nobel Prize at the same time. And one of the reporters asked Andy and I, what does the you know, medicine prize have to do with physics this year? You know, is there some connection? And the only answer I could come up with is that living things uh, exist on a cosmic time scale. And that is the first part of my talk. Just because I work on the germline, I get to talk about this. Germlines are literally, almost literally, potentially as immortal as anything can be in this universe. They're lifetime really is determined by the cosmology of the planet that they live on, our planet. As long as it's here, germlines in one form or another are going to keep on going uh, as long as it's a hospitable place to live. Yeah, one caveat. <laughs> Minor caveat, maybe. Uh, but here are the, uh, these are the nuclei in the ovary. So the, the dark circles, that's where the DNA is inside. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little refresher on all the major biomolecules that you need to know. DNA is one of them. Um, the green stuff that you see here, are, these are mitochondria. And mitochondria are, are fascinating in their own right because they have their own DNA as well. And they are, they are what some people refer to as endosymbiont that colonized a cell, one of our ancestors, you know, well over a, a billion years ago. And now they're sort of part of every cell in our body. They're a really important part, but they have their own genetic information as well. So there's the DNA in here, and then there's a bunch of DNA inside all of these mitochondria that are important. So that's information that's, that's passing into the next generation. These are the eggs that are forming. And you can see the cytoplasm filling the egg. And then you see these little red dots, right, floating around. And it's a funny story, but the first time I ever showed this picture to my mom, she said, Craig, work on those things. Those are important, you know? And she's, it, and it's a true story. Turns out, almost all of the things I work on now come right back to these little guys. These are RNA-filled granules that contain uh, small RNAs that pass information from one generation to the next. And uh, so in addition to the DNA, which is in there, there's all this information in the cytoplasm. And of course, there's this uh, information inside these little RNA-containing granules. Um, and I'll tell you more about those later on in my talk. So a little bit of cosmology because I wanted to be an astronomer. So I get to show, and I work on something that's immortal. Uh, so here's a little picture of the night sky, courtesy of a uh, NASA website. And uh, what you're seeing here, of course, is the Big Dipper. And they did this really cool thing with the Hubble Space Telescope. They pointed it out at a part of the night sky where there are no stars in the Milky Way, in the way. And then they just left the shutter open for like days. 
and they took pictures of outer space to look really deep into, into, into the universe. And so here you can see this little slit of uh, the night sky is blown up here. And here's one little picture uh, frame blown up here. And the thing that is truly amazing about this picture is that every single speck of light that you see here is a galaxy. Many of them are billions of light years away. In fact, some of them are at the very limits of where we can see to, which is something like 13.7 billion years of light years away. And so uh, this is amazing because when you extrapolate based on these little pictures, and, and, and mind you, everywhere you look in the universe, every single bit of the night sky that you look at is the same in every direction you see these galaxies uh, at the limits of, of the visible universe. Uh, there are literally hundreds of billions of galaxies in the visible night sky. And there are, in every galaxy, hundreds of billions of stars. And, you know, as what, what it, for me, growing up, one of the things I realized is I was fascinated by the stars and wanted to explore them. But we are here. We're at a star. We've got our own star. We've got our own planet. As a biologist, I, I, you know, when I read about the E. coli making insulin, I was really energized by the thought that we can study, we can try to understand what's going on here. Surely there's amazing things happening out here in the universe, uh, and we could someday, maybe we'll actually get a better view at some of the things that are happening here somehow. I don't know how. Uh, John's going to have to solve that problem. Maybe a really good telescope will get us that information. But let's go back in time now, just a moment, because again, the germline, I mentioned the C. elegans germline, journeyed with our own germline for three billion years. So obviously, worms and humans share a lot in common. This picture on the right-hand side here shows you uh, the Earth in an event called a snowball Earth event, which have occurred periodically in the history of this planet and I think are very interesting because, again, as I mentioned earlier, we think of life um, often as um, sort of on a trajectory that leads to humans. You know, we often think of progressive evolution as though we're more sophisticated than bacteria um, or worms, but we're not. The fact is, everything alive is truly, uh, you know, amazingly sophisticated, and there's a really good reason for that. Everything alive has shared this remarkable common ancestry, and this is uh, what I'm going to try to illustrate here. And the, you know, the history of life, of course, is punctuated by cosmological events, things like meteor impacts and these snowball earth events that have had tremendous impacts on living things on the planet. Um, and the germline has kept on through all of this time. This event here that you're seeing uh, illustrated in this slide that I took from uh, uh, Nature magazine, I believe, shows you the Cambrian explosion in this rapid diversification of animals in the fossil record that uh, was remarked on by Darwin and has been a mystery to biologists, I, I think, for uh, hundred, over hundreds of years at this point. But it's clear that something remarkable happened in the history of life at that point. And if you, uh, again, uh, you know, if you look at the, the common ancestor of worms and humans, it's somewhere back here about uh, 800 million years ago. And the origin of life is 3.8 billion years. It's way down here uh, on the bottom, uh, you know, maybe in the floor below here. Um, and. Uh, the inter RNA interference mechanism that Andrew Fire and I shared the prize for uh, arose about one and a half billion years ago. And so there are really ancient uh, mechanisms at work inside of our cells. And I want to try to just, I want to try to put this in perspective for you because I think it's important to, for you to sort of get what's going on in biology right now. Why, uh, you know, would someone like myself work on a worm at a medical school. Why is that relevant to humans? I'll try to get that across just by trying to put this in a little bit more perspective. So 
About four and a half billion years ago, the Earth formed from the remnants of supernova uh, that had uh, distributed the elements in a, in a cloud that uh, coalesced into our solar system. So four and a half billion years ago uh, is when the Earth formed. And the part of this slide that I showed you earlier, the Cambrian explosion, is right here, way up here. So the first cells remarkably arise in the fossil record only 700 million years after the Earth is cooled uh, enough for you know, life to, to uh, live. So that's a remarkably short amount of time. On the other hand, 700 million years is also a very long time. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know how, quite how to think about that. Um, but during this time, there's almost zero oxygen on the planet because there's no photosynthesis. That's where the oxygen that we have on our planet comes from. And interestingly, there's an event in the history of life called the oxygen catastrophe. You can't make this stuff up. It's really, it's pretty amazing. Oxygen catastrophe. So cyanobacteria, about two and a half billion years ago, started to make oxygen because they developed something called photosynthesis. This is really, really, you know, sophisticated biologically because the, all there's, there's a lot of enzymes involved in this. There's a lot of evolution that had to occur between these first cells and these first cells that could make oxygen. But when they started releasing oxygen into the Earth's atmosphere, something happened. The cyanobacteria didn't know this was happening, but they were causing something that uh, led to the longest snowball Earth event in the history of life, almost 100 million years estimated from the geochemistry of the rocks deposited at the time, that almost wiped out the cyanobacteria. What happened was the oxygen they were releasing reacted with the greenhouse gas methane, which was keeping the Earth warm, and you know, basically eliminated that greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. And consequently, the Earth uh, cooled dramatically, almost wiping out all life, including the cyanobacteria. Can you imagine one organism messing with the atmosphere and ruining it for all the rest of us? That's what happened there. And it almost wiped us out, but amazingly, somehow, they muddled through this ice age, uh, and eventually, the Earth recovered and developed uh, new greenhouse effects uh, and um, managed. These are estimates in the oxygen levels based on geochemical ev evidence in rocks. And you can see that there wasn't a lot of oxygen, apparently, until right below the Cambrian. There are a couple of more snowball events that happened here. Uh, and, the, and suddenly, around this time, you have sufficient levels of oxygen. And this, I think, may help explain the Cambrian explosion, this burst in diversity. Animals could not be big below the Cambrian because there was not enough oxygen for them to be able to metabolize and make a larger body and still uh, be able to supply um, energy to their tissues. So they needed this oxygen level to go up. This is when land was first colonized after this snowball event. Uh, you had the plants evolving and land animals first evolving. Amazing, amazing uh, events in the history of life. And I think what you can appreciate from this is this is where most people start to think about evolution as, you know, evolving from, you know, fish to, you know, reptiles, you know, to mammals, and it's like this progressive thing. No. These organisms were incredibly sophisticated. Everything alive on the planet during all this time was already a truly sophisticated uh, creature. We have a lot to learn from them because we shared all this ancestral time with them. So the mechanisms like the genetic code that I mentioned earlier are shared between bacteria and humans because we share all this common ancestry. That's at least one partly the explanation. Now, if you put this time scale on the, on the calendar year, it's really, I think, also informative to think about. So the fir if the year starts with the Earth uh, forming, the Cambrian explosion happens on November 18th. And this little line across here is the dinosaur extinction, which occurs December 27th at 4 a.m. And our, our ancestors were little shrew-like 
mammals when the dinosaurs uh, went extinct. And we have most likely the, the, the favorite explanation is a cosmic impact that uh, dealt the dinosaurs that blow. If that hadn't happened, uh, it's very likely there'd still be dinosaurs because they'd been doing fine for a couple hundred million years. Uh, it's kind of hard to imagine why just 60 million years later uh, we would be here, but we are. Um, and of course, the difference between a human and a chimpanzee is the thickness of this little dotted line, um, just a few million years. So I think we really have to um, appreciate or try to appreciate the meaning of all this time. It's a huge amount of time. And what it's telling us, I think, is that everything alive, we can't help but underestimate the sophistication of how our bodies work, of how the cells you know, that are on our bodies, bacteria, viruses, they're incredibly sophisticated. They have a lot to teach us. And uh, that's, that's why I love biology. Now, um, the next couple of slides are going to give you all the information, if you're not a biologist, everything you need to know to understand the basics of biology is going to come in the next couple of slides. And I have to show this one. Uh, it is from Nova Science Now because it explains what RNA is. I was giving a lecture once, and it was to a radio audience, and the, the radio host said, you know, my listeners don't know what RNA is. Can I just call it protein? And I said, no, <laughs> sorry. So I, I went into a big explanation of RNA, and I have no idea if they understood a single word I said. But I'm going to try to explain what RNA is, but it, I think uh, this is a nice little segment that shows you how important mm. RNA is. Every creature, and you know this from high school, is made from a recipe that comes from its DNA, spelled out in chemicals A's and C's and T's and G's inside the famous double helix. Every creature has its own DNA, different for mice, and then for whales, and for flowers, but to go from a chemical recipe, A's, G's and T's, to a real creature that squeaks, or soars through the air, or turns gloriously pink, that requires RNA. RNA is the thing that turns you from a chemical code to a real, pulsing, living creature. RNA builds life. That's big. So sort of the RNA-centric view of biology. <laughs> um, yeah, RNA is definitely big. It, in, uh, one analogy I'll make in, in a few of my other slides is that RNA is like the software in your computer. It's the stuff that sort of tells the thing what it's supposed to do. You know, you've got the hardware, and then you've got the software, the programming. And, and of course, uh, RNA is, um, is intimately involved in that. And the genetic structure of DNA, I think, is uh, RNA is very similar to that. So um, the DNA has four letters to its alphabet. And how you arrange those four different letters is what tells you what that gene is going to do. So you have different genes that are encoded using those four different letters. It's a very simple language, um, but it has, and it has only four letters, but it can make all of the biological diversity that you see uh, around you in this world is driven by those four letters, how they're arranged. And RNA is, as you'll see in this next movie, uh, a transcribed directly from the DNA. So in this movie, we're flying into the nucleus. So here we go, like, in a tiny spaceship, flying along the chromatin. This is the DNA in the chromosome that's wound up, and, and now you're looking at the DNA being expressed. This is the, a gene being transcribed. That's RNA polymerase, this big green blob. Um, and what you're seeing here is the process of making the RNA transcript. So the, g the gene is being read, and the nucleotide sequence is, is being transferred into this molecule called RNA. And then uh, you also saw splicing, and there's a few little processing events that occur. And then the transcript leaves the nucleus, goes out into the cytoplasm of the cell, where it's going to encounter something called the ribosome. This is an amazing complex of RNA and protein that translates the information in this sequence of letters by reading them, three nucleotides at a time, uh, to decipher the amino acid sequence. And that's the, you saw the protein coming out. This is double-stranded RNA, and this is a depiction 
of RNA interference mechanism occurring where uh, this is a, I'll tell you more about this factor here called an argonaut that gets loaded with this short piece of genetic information that's an RNA segment that's about 21 nucleotides long and it uses that genetic information to search for and find matching information in the cell and then it can cleave it, okay? So uh, this mechanism that you're seeing depicted here is a genetic regulatory mechanism that occurs after the gene is transcribed. So you saw sort of the cradle to the death there of a message. The message came, was transcribed, it was made, it went out into the cytoplasm of the cell, it was translated into protein by the ribosome, and then uh, a scientist injected a needle, and the needle delivered double-stranded RNA. Double-stranded RNA was loaded onto this enzyme called an argonaut that searched out, found that genetic information, and silenced it. And of course, the cell has this machinery, not so that scientists can stick needles in the cell and do this, but so that the cell can use this machinery to do what it needs to do. And I'll just try to uh, explain that a little bit more in a moment. We'll come back to that. But first I have to show you the, the real Nobel Prize winner, which is this elegant little worm called C. elegans. Fortunately, they're much smaller than this. This is about the size of a comma, actually, on a printed page. And uh, one of the remarkable things, one of the really wonderful things about this model organism um, is here again, you can see the ovary. You can see the oocytes queued up inside the animal. Um, you can see right through it. It's a transparent animal, making it very easy for us to see the neurons, the intestine, the muscle. Um, they have a very simple brain composed of about 300 neurons. They have uh, muscles very much like ours. They have intestinal cells that are very much like ours. Remember, we were worms, just like these guys. Probably our common ancestor surely looked a lot more like this worm than it did us. I'll guarantee you that. Um, but this is already a very sophisticated little animal. It can actually learn and it can remember something for about a day, which is about the same as your average undergraduate. That's <laughs> true. Um, so they, they have a lot to teach us still ab about ourselves. And uh, as it indicates down here, uh, this little animal, study done on this little animal, has led to actually three different Nobel Prizes. One of them was for the, um, the GFP that you saw earlier, the green fluorescent protein tag, uh, was a chemistry prize. And then there was another prize for working out uh, something called uh, the cell death pathway in C. elegans as well. So, um, and they're, they're really uh, a lot more exciting things to, to learn about this animal. Now, uh, you're probably wondering why I'm showing you this slide, but I, I like to put it up here because you kind of never know where you're going to learn something really, really valuable, right? You really do need to study a variety of different things because each organism that's alive on this planet, again, they're survivors. They've been here for billions of years and they have things to teach us. Each, each lineage alive today has some trick up its sleeve. And we really, we have an opportunity. If we take the, take the time, we have an opportunity to really learn some important things, not only about ourselves, but of course about them. And um, believe it or not, these guys, which you've probably eaten many times, they call, call them caw hogs, they can live to be 400 years old and, and even older probably. So, you know, why do we age? It's a very interesting question. There's some fascinating new biology suggesting that uh, there, it's not inevitable, that there are ways that organisms can avoid uh, the deterioration that we all face in, in the aging process, and including uh, perhaps some very exciting work um, suggesting that there may be some really cool tricks coming for humans in the not too distant future. So hang in there if you're over 50 like me. <laughs> so coming back to the, to the um, mechanism that Andrew Fire and I were working on back in the 90s, um, this uh, picture is showing what's called a crystal structure 
of the protein that's at the heart of that mechanism. This is the protein that was holding on to the short piece of RNA that I pointed to and using it to search for complementary information. And what this is, is the cellular equivalent of a search engine or your Google of the cell. So when you want to find something on the internet, you can type in a short search query. Just a few letters of the alphabet is sufficient to find uh, what you're looking for. So if you want to find Shakespeare, a particular play, type in a couple of words, to be or not to be. I guarantee you will find the entire play and you'll be all set in, very, in many different languages too. Um, so this, that's the cell figured out, first of all, the cell is swimming in information. And I forgot to say this when I showed you that movie. The cell, you know, that movie showed this polymerase sort of majestically moving along the DNA. No, that's not how it works. In reality, that polymerase moves at the rate of 50, it incorporates the, MO, the RNA nucleotides at the rate of over 50 per second, flawlessly, without a single mistake most of the time. For thousands of nucleotides, it can transit that DNA 50 per second. And the ribosome, that little blob in the cytoplasm that translate it, translate that information at, at a rate of around 20 codons per second. So the cell, don't think of it as, as this sort of sloppy, you know, protoplasm or something from the from the glob or, you know, what this stuff is, it's, it's like a computer. This stuff, it, you know, think of those little red dots in the, in the cell moving around, the little glowing things my mom said to work on. This, your, your cell, the inner workings of your cells, they're like computers. They're processing information from the environment and the cell needs to be able to respond to that. It can't respond if it can't change its gene expression program. So the cell can transcribe new genes but it also has to deal with the genes that are already transcribed. So it has to turn over genes that are, have been expressed previously. And this search engine is part of the cellular mechanism for doing that. And the structure that you're seeing here is showing you the guide RNA in red and the target RNA shown in blue. And what you're watching inside the structure of the protein, so the protein are all of these colorful folds that are wrapped around. And you can see down the, the helical um, structure of this RNA paired with its target. Um, there's a huge amount of chemical specificity in each of these base pairing interactions. So the red strand uniquely specifies this blue target through chemical interactions that are defined by the order of the bases in the t in the guide strand. So the guide strand uniquely specifies the sequence in this blue target strand, just the same way that your search engine on your computer looks for the words to be or not to be. It's like that's typed out right here in this red strand, and the match for that is found here in the blue strand. Now, this enzyme, ra the, R the red strand wraps around the target and places the target strand right up against a nuclei nucleolytic center that can cleave the target strand, turning that, that information over. And this enzyme can function, again, very rapidly, multiple turnovers per second inside the cell. This enzyme can totally reverse the expression of that gene, can shut it down with only a single guide RNA loaded. And what was really exciting about the discovery that we took part in was not just the discovery that this exists, which was exciting, but that we could learn how to enter search queries into the search engine inside the cell. Because what Andy and I figured out was that by making the um, RNA molecule that we gave to the cell a double-stranded molecule, the this, this cell would recognize that as a search query that could be then processed and loaded into this search engine. So by designing a double-stranded RNA, which is basically 
a synthetic RNA that kind of looks like this thing that's loaded right here. We could design one of these in, in the laboratory to contain any sequence we want. And then we could give it to cells. The cells would use that information to find the target sequences that are existing in that cell and regulate them. So we not only learned by studying the basic biology of this worm, we learned that, first of all, that animals do this. And then we learned that we can do it. We learned how to do it from a worm, okay? Humans do this too. Not a single one of us would be here in this room alive today if it wasn't for the same kind of search mechanism. And uh, in fact, I have this come back up here because what, for if you're like me, you know, my dad's a great speller, but I'm not so good at spelling. And uh, one of the great things I like about Google is sort of this I'm feeling lucky thing, you know. Uh, you, can, you can misspell a word and it still finds the thing that you're looking for. Well, cells figured that out too. There's a whole branch of this search engine. There's a whole separate search engine machinery that tolerates misspelling. So the animal with misspelled complement, we call it complementarity, with mismatched uh, information, it can now, one of these red guides, instead of targeting just one sequence, can target hundreds or even potentially thousands of different targets. So it's an incredibly, you know, it seems stupid, but I've used search engines before that don't tolerate misspelling. So I think people still make them on some websites and you actually have to go back and figure out what you spelled wrong because it says it got no hits. And, uh, you know, so it's really incredible. I think we probably could not have appreciated the, any of this biology if we hadn't also been entering the information age ourselves. So uh, another theme from my talk, I think, is that if you want to learn really important things, you should study organisms that live in the dirt. Because, um, you know, I showed you the call hog that lives to be 400 years old. You know, worms, they live in the soil. Uh, and now there's another really breathtaking discovery, a really, I think, uh, amazing breakthrough in, um, in genetics, and it comes from bacteria. And this is showing you Streptococcus, uh, but essentially every bacteria, E. coli, you know, they all have really amazing antiviral mechanisms that are analogous to the RNAi machinery. I want to tell you a little bit about that. But first, I want to introduce you to something. And it's really funny. I was trying to, I, we were having a dinner table conversation and, and, uh, with my daughter, who's now 13. And I had one of these rare moments when you realize that you actually communicated with a teenager. <laughs> um, I was trying to explain what I'm about to try to explain to you, to my daughter. And at one moment, she stopped me and she said, wait a minute, Dad. Are you telling me that bacteria get sick? And I knew I had gotten through to her, that I had actually communicated with her. Amazingly enough, bacteria get uh, infections just like you or I. Um, in fact, here's a, here's a picture of a bacteriophage taken with an electron microscope. They, um, you know, back to the cosmology theme, they look a lot like the lunar lander. They have these amazing um, icosahedral structures with their DNA is packed inside there. And this is an image taken uh, from seawater where what you're looking at, the little tiny specks are bacterial viruses. We call them phage. And the big things are bacteria, or eukaryotic cells that are in the seawater. So it's been estimated that there are about 10 to the 7 phage per milliliter of water. And if you do the math, and that's water everywhere in the water column. If you do the math, there's something like 10 to the 32 phage on the planet, which is, um, is a staggering number. So going back to the cosmology theme, the, if you take each one of these little guys, they're about 100 billionths of a meter long, so they're really, 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 really tiny. And if you stack them on top of each other, they, believe it or not, I had to check the math myself because I heard this lecture by someone else. 
they will reach 200 million light years into space. <laughs> I know John's going to double check that math, but that's, it seems to add up. Anyway, that's a, even if, if this number, if this number seems staggeringly large, um, it's a really incredible number. Um, there's a huge diversity of viruses out there. We are living with viruses constantly. And I think it's really interesting because the mechanisms that I told you about, the RNA interference mechanism, it's an antiviral mechanism. I told you the cell also uses it to regulate its own genes, but it also can be used by the cell to defend against viruses. Um, and as you can see here, bacteria are faced with viruses constantly as well. So they ha also have remarkably sophisticated mechanisms for combating viruses. And you know, thanks to basic science and bacteriologists doing really cool science, trying to figure out how these bacteriophage are, you know, how, do, how does life even exist when there's so many viruses out there trying to get in? Well, you know, honestly, it's another topic, but I would say it's, we're probably all here because the viruses do need us. You know, that's basically probably all the whole reason we're, we're here. Um, but, but basically, uh, there's a, a really interesting stuff going on in bacteriological research. This is a, a nice image because uh, this is an artist's rendering of some of the surface architecture of these phage. Uh, they land on the bacterial cell wall and they insert the DNA directly through the cell wall into their target. It looks like something out of a you know, horror movie. Um, they, they're real, and this is molecular, each of these, you know, what you're seeing here are the artist's rendering of these structures that are actually proteins that are encoded by the phage, the virus genome. And, uh, and then this, this particle here is stuffed with the virus DNA, and that's injected uh, through this mechanism into the cell that they're going to infect. And, and you can, I felt since I was stealing it from the internet, I might as well show you that you can buy this for 95 bucks. <laughs> I, it's not me that did it. I'm not going to get anything if you do. But I felt in full disclosure I had to show you that you could actually buy that picture. So here's an art, this, this is a scientific uh, summary of this, this bacterial antiviral mechanism. So the virus comes in, injects its DNA into the, into the, vir into the bacterial cell, and the bacterial cell then can, uh, in some cases, the bacteria dies. In other cases, the bacteria can um, respond to the virus. And what it does is really clever. It chops the virus into pieces and takes the viral DNA pieces after they're cleaved and inserts them into the bacterial genome. It makes copies of fragments of the bacterium in the E. coli genome or the bacterial genome. And then it can re-express these little pieces of bacterial DNA. And it has a whole bunch of these immunity genes that are linked to this. We call it CRISPR, uh, just as a, it's an acronym for the, what the bacteriologists named this uh, structure originally. And believe it or not, you guys, if you haven't, if you've been reading the, new, the papers, New York Times, you'll be hearing about this. This is really exciting uh, biology, this CRISPR. Uh, OK, so then. Uh, these little pieces get re-expressed by the bacterial cell. The RNA chunks in each different color represents a different virus that infected that um, bacterium at some point in its life. They get processed out of a, of a transcript and then get loaded onto a search enzyme that's, again, very analogous to the RNAi mechanism but it's actually t totally independently evolved. So bacteria evolved this independently. Um, they get loaded, and I've got a structure here that looks, looks kind of familiar, right? You can see base pairing interactions here. This is a crystal structure uh, showing you how the um, guide RNA, which is partly uh, embedded here, and the guide strand uh, it here is green. And the target strand, this time it's DNA instead of RNA, is here. And the other DNA strand is actually not in the crystal structure, uh, but gets unwound. So now this is targeting the DNA itself. And the, the bacterium can now cut 
the virus using this enzyme preventing the infection the next time, right? So the first time you get sick, if you survive, you make copies of fragments of the virus and you become immune. It's an adaptive immune mechanism. It allows the animal to become immune, the virus, I mean the bacterium, to become immune. And this is just another rendering of this crystal structure. You can see the protein folds are here in these different colors. And the RNA, guide RNA, is here. And the DNA strand is, is here in red, the target strand. And this is a nice one because it, it uh, is animated. And you can see how this, this uh, protein can unfold and wrap itself around the target DNA. What's really remarkable, too, about this is this, this machinery can search through the eukaryotic chromatin, the human chromatin, inside of, uh, I don't think I said this yet. So this is bacterial, right? You can express this bacterial enzyme in any cell using the same kinds of approaches that I uh, told you about earlier, like the ones where we introduced the GFP. You can express this enzyme and the guide RNA in a human cell or in a worm or in a plant. And this, this enzyme will then target whatever sequence you load it with. So you can basically guide this enzyme to any target sequence in the human genome. And this enzyme will then precisely cut the DNA of the human gene that you're targeting. So you can synthetically guide this with an RNA to a target sequence. And what this does is it allows us, almost in a sense, it, it makes one organis all organisms one organism. Because if I find a gene Let's say uh, I'm at a medical school and one of my colleagues finds a gene that's involved in autism and there's a worm homologue of that autism gene. He can say, hey, let's make a mutation in the worm version of this human autism-related gene and find out if it has a phenotype related perhaps to mer um, learning or maybe the worms become you know, less friendly or something. Or uh, I don't know, but you can do lots of experiments very quickly. Um, in fact, you know, there's all these disease alleles. There's thousands of disease alleles now, and the list keeps growing. And what we need to do as scientists is model those disease alleles in order to find out, you know, the, you know, what's underlying the disease. This tool is allowing scientists to do that, and now it will also allow scientists to genetically uh, correct lesions that cause genetic disease. So in some settings where the cells can be taken out of the patient and, um, and taken into the laboratory to do this kind of genetic engineering, we can precisely fix uh, mutations in human cells. So this is really exciting work. Now, the bacterial system that I just told you about, this CRISPR system, is not in human cells. So in order to use it in human cells, you have to not only introduce the guide RNA, but also the enzyme itself. So you have to provide a gene encoding the bacterial um, search engine. But when we discovered the RNAi mechanism, it was uh, really exciting because we discovered this gene. This is a worm gene. And what you're looking at here is a family tree of all the genes that are related, and this isn't even all of them, this is some of the genes that are related to the worm gene. And what you can see here on this map is the relationship of, you know, how far RDE1 is from these other genes tells you uh, how divergent they are in their sequence. So this gene, RDE1, is more similar to these genes over here and less similar to these genes over here. So this is like a family tree that can tell you, um, you know, based on the genetic sequence, how similar they are. They all have the same motif. They all are capable of holding a search, a guide RNA, and doing the search mechanism. Um, and what we were really excited about was that, that here's RDE1. Here are four human genes that are, are related to RDE1. And there are two worm genes that are very similar to those four human genes. So the worm actually has genes that are related to RDE1, but are more closely related to these human genes than they are to this other worm gene. 
Similarly, this gene, which is a worm gene that's related to RD1, is very similar to four other human genes over here on this branch of the tree. So the common ancestor of worms and humans already had members of this search engine family and members of this search engine family. Okay, these are the argonaut proteins. And this one, when we knock it out in the worm, is absolutely wipes out the RNAi, double-stranded RNA response. So these other pathways, we knew were probably doing something different, and that the human and the worm maybe had some common mechanism that involved this type of a search protein. Okay, these are the guys that tolerate the misspelling right here. That's, those are my friends. Um, so we can, these guys actually are regulating thousands of different human genes over here, these four guys. We call them the microRNA argonauts. They function with genes that encode tiny search queries that regulate other genes. So the animal intentionally transcribes really tiny genes to make short RNA guides that get loaded onto these guys, mainly this human gene called AGO2, that human gene can then use the guide information to regulate other genes. So that's a really important fundamental part of how all of our cells function. That's really just basic gene regulation. This guy is an antiviral guy. That's why when we knock that out in the worm, the worm in the laboratory is totally fine. If you give it a virus, it gets really, really sick. But it's totally fine in the laboratory. Uh, and then all of these guys, this is a, these are all worm genes that have been expanded in the worm genome. So we think of ourselves as more sophisticated, but when it comes to argonauts, worms have us you know, totally out, outclassed. Worms have 26 of these guys. And again, if you're eating dirt every day, you know, <laughs> probably you're going to need some really good immune system. And that's, that's why I wasn't really joking when I said if you study animals that are eating dirt, you're probably going to learn something pretty important. Well, this, this machinery here is involved in uh, some really interesting pathways, and I'll just mention one more of them. Um, it's part of this pathway, too. So the antiviral pathway involves argonauts at more than one step. This pathway here is it's still very mysterious in the human. Uh, this is, these guys, these argonauts over here, are abundantly expressed in the human testes. And in the mouse, there are four of these um, in the mouse. When you knock out any one of them, the mouse is sterile. So they're absolutely required for mouse fertility. In C. elegans, they're also required for fertility. And um, guess where they localize, mom? Right in these little structures. So my mom was right. I should work on those. Uh, this is the peewee argonaut localizing to these uh, perinuclear, we call them, these structures that surround the germline nuclei. And uh, this is one of the argonauts involved in that expanded group that was at the bottom. This argonaut also localizes there. And then this argonaut, another one, localizes there as well. So these are just showing you in three different pictures when we stain for this argonaut, in other words, we're looking at the localization of this protein, it's in these perinuclear germline granules that I showed you in the first movie. And this, even though it's stained with a different color, uh, these are the same structures, these green dots. Uh, just They also contain this other argonaut, and they contain yet another argonaut here. This is, this is the one that has the close human homolog expressed in the testes. So fascinating, right? What the heck is going on? Why is the germline so packed with information or these small RNA pathways that are involved in searching information. What is it doing? And uh, for a long time, this was a, for a couple of years, we were totally stuck. We could not figure this out. The laboratory was getting nowhere trying to understand what these guys are doing. But now we have had a major breakthrough just a couple, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, and it turns out that these guys are working together and they're doing something that is even more cool than what the bacterium is doing. They're working together in an immunity mechanism that is, I think, unbelievable. Because what they're doing, so I told you, the bacterial cell gets infected, right? 
And then it makes a memory of the infectious agent so that it'll be immune in the future. Well, what if you could remember all of your genes so you know what's you and what's not you immediately without having to wait to get infected? That's what the worm is doing with the system. It generates a memory of self-gene expression using this argonaut. And a memory of non-self is generated and stored in this argonaut family. And this is a scanning factor. It's constantly searching, tolerating mismatches. Misspelling is OK. And is looking for foreign sequences. It's, an incre it's almost like science fiction. I mean, you could not make this up. It is a really crazy, cool way of running. You know, this is the immortal germline. Errors are not good, right? Because, you know, if you mess this up, it's all over. Not just for you, but your future generations. Um, so it turns out one key factor involved in this is this enzyme called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This is, a, this is a polymerase that copies the information in RNA and makes an RNA copy. And a lot of organisms have this. Humans don't have this particular enzyme. They may have to do this a different way if they do it. We're, not, we're still not sure that humans can even do this. It may be some, something that worms can do that we can't do, believe it or not. But it's incredibly interesting uh, because this enzyme works in conjunction using all the RNA normally expressed in the germline, the normal genes, the genes that normally are doing the housekeeping functions that are required for the maintenance of life. All of those genes are copied by this enzyme, and the small RNA produced by that enzyme is loaded onto this, and that becomes a memory of self-gene expression that the animal can use to protect itself. And um, I'll just briefly tell you a little bit more. This is the RNAi pathway as, in, as it responds to viruses, which often have double-stranded RNA genomes. I mentioned in bacteria they have DNA genomes frequently, but they also have RNA genomes in bacteria. Anyway, an RNAi response can be initiated by double-stranded RNA. It gets processed and then loaded into, as short RNAs into this argonaut called RDE1. It searches for, finds targets, but not only does it find them, it recruits RDRP, which then amplifies the silencing signal, allowing the worm to clear the virus. So it's got an amplification mechanism that's part of this pathway. And it turns out that there are a variety of, of pathways, small RNA pathways, that rely on this amplification machinery that worms have to generate these memories. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the detailed model of what we were thinking at the time uh, back in 1998 when we first started working on this, but I, I wanted to point this out because, you know, it's really powerful when you can read the search queries. If you've got an information system like the World Wide Web and you can read what people are searching for, that's really powerful. And, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, I think, that we, all this hoopla over this, you know, the events where we found out the NSA was reading our search queries. I mean, come on, everybody. Everybody knows they were reading the search queries. I mean, Google reads your search queries, too. Uh, that's why you keep getting those annoying ads on your um, browser. Um, but we could read the search queries in the cell, too, right? And that was really powerful for us. That's how we sort of got a breakthrough on this, this uh, story, because we started reading the search queries, and that's when we found out that this argonaut, so what we would do is we would pull down the different components of those mysterious germline granules, pull them down independently of each other, and then recover the RNA that associates with this enzyme and sequence it to determine what, what is the cell using that search engine for. And that's when we found out that it's targeting its own genes with this one. This guy, the Caesar one argonaut, is targeting its own genes. And, and that was very confounding at first. This guy was more easily, easily understood because it was targeting something called transposons, which are little selfish DNA elements that hop around and create havoc by inserting themselves all over the genome. Turns out that our genome is 50% transposon DNA. So they're, they're rampant in every organism on the planet. These guys are hopping around constantly. And this pathway is involved in suppressing them. Um, that was clear. So it wasn't, 
it at all clear why the animal would have these argonauts that are targeting, or uh, it's you know directly targeting, perfectly complementary to its own genes. The other thing that was remarkable, as I showed you where these guys localize, they're in the egg, in those RNA granules, they're also in the sperm. So they're in both the egg and the sperm. They're in the gametes, right where you need them to be able to transmit um, information. So the breakthrough for us, in, and I think it's a lesson also uh, that uh, I, I think tells you where you should look if you want to make a breakthrough, you should look in your trash can because that's how we, we got this breakthrough for the lab was we were introducing transgenes in, into the germline where we wanted the transgene to be expressed, right? So you're, we call it a transgene when we make a gene artificially in the laboratory and put it in. So in this case, for example, we're putting in green fluorescent protein from jellyfish. That's a jellyfish gene, introducing it into the worm, and we're looking for it to be expressed like it is here, beautifully transcribed. You can see this nuclear GFP signal telling us that our, we had succeeded. But frequently, we got events like this where there was just nothing expressed. It was lights off. And for the longest time, we were throwing those away uh, and, and never appreciating that there might be silencing going on. These strains were completely dead. It wasn't just like they were weakly expressed or patchy or something. They were totally dead. And so we thought that we had made a mistake, like the animals when we introduced this guy got a defective copy or something like that. And it wasn't until Masaki got suspicious and he went back and he fished some of these out and he started looking at them, he realized there's nothing wrong with them. They're perfect. There's nothing wrong with that DNA. It's precisely exactly like the DNA here. It's just not being expressed. And that oddly, it stays off permanently. For generation after generation, we can grow worms for 30, 40 generations. It's just always off. So he did something really simple. He took a silent one and an active one, and he crossed them together. And if you're familiar with Mendel, he very nicely showed that what you should get is a quarter that are on, and you know everybody should have half, and then a quarter that are off. But this is what he got. Dominantly, this line, when he crossed it to this active line, turned it off. And not only did it go off, it stayed off when he separated the two. So he could now take this, separate it back, so now it's the same as it was before, that great bright green nucleus is now silent, and it stays off, which was amazing. So he had changed the state of the gene. We call it epigenetics, when it's not actually a genetic change. It's, a, it's something happened that now switched that gene off. And what it, I'm, I'm not going to have time to go into that. In fact, I'm just going to show maybe one more slide after this. Uh, this is the sort of the, the simplest model that we made to try to depict this to, to our audience when we published this last year. So it turns out that the, the Argonaut that humans have a copy of, the one that was on the green side, the left-hand side, is called a peewee Argonaut. This Argonaut engages small RNAs that are encoded in our genome. Humans have millions of pi RNAs, we call them, little RNAs that are transcribed in the testes primarily in humans. In the worm, they're in, in the ovary as well as the testes. They get loaded onto this peewee Argonaut. And this peewee argonaut tolerates mispaired uh, matches. And there's so many, and they're so sequence diverse, that this argonaut targets everything that's transcribed. Every single message that's transcribed in the germline is being scanned constantly by this argonaut, like this flashlight here depicts. It's just basically looking, do I have a match? Do I have a match? It looks at every single sequence that's being transcribed. If there's a memory of having transcribed that previously, this Argonaut, and we don't know how yet, can protect an RNA from this searching and scanning mechanism, allowing that gene to be expressed. We call these licensed messages. These guys have been expressed before, and there's a Caesar one protective memory. If there's no protective memory, 
and this finds a reasonably good match, it recruits RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and that makes a perfectly complementary match to this messenger RNA, gets loaded onto one of these memory argonauts. These guys now create a memory of non-self, and they also can work with RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, again, to propagate that memory to the next generation. So by having these argonauts present in the sperm, along with the RNAs and in the egg, along with their guide RNAs, they can regulate and transmit a memory of previous gene expression from one generation to the next, which is uh, a really fascinating uh, bit of biology. We have a lot still to learn about how this works. So you were right, Mom. These guys are really interesting things. Um, and uh, we have a lot to learn still about how they function. And I want to end my talk now with a um, picture from Stockholm. This is Victoria, my daughter, who was um, six years old at the time. And uh, we went to the Nobel Prize headquarters, and John can testify to this, and Jane as well. That place is amazing. Everywhere you look, there are gold medals. They're just like everywhere. So I told Vicky, of course, you know, you know, grab as many of those as you can. So she's um, collecting them here. And, uh, you know, this is actually, for me, a really poignant slide. Uh, you know, of course, Vicky's very cute, but what you can't see is that for her to eat that chocolate, she has to give herself insulin because at the age of one and a half, she developed type 1 diabetes. And uh, the, these are chocolate-filled gold medals, of course. That's what makes them very special. Um, and uh, so, you know, ironically, when I was a kid, I was inspired by the discovery that bacteria could make human insulin for patients and what a, a powerful thing that, would, that is. But this is really, you know, the discovery of insulin was the first real major triumph of molecular biology. Um, you know, this was amazing work done by, you know, basic scientists in Toronto who discovered uh, this substance from the pancreas that could uh, save these children who are on their deathbeds. Without insulin, people like Vicky would, would and did die until uh, the end of the, around the end of the 1920s uh, when Banting and Best and McLeod uh, first purified insulin from animals um, and, and developed an extraction procedure that produced animal insulin that saved the lives of patients. And these patients were literally on their deathbeds, and they got up and lived, some of them, to be 80 years old. So Vicki can have a pretty normal life, but every single day she needs to have insulin therapy to stay alive. So uh, there are, the, the reason I like to show this is this is a, just an example of what we can and are and, are and have to do as a society. You know, I think you really can measure your society by how you treat your most vulnerable uh, population. And there are so many diseases that we now know a lot about, and we can make a difference in the lives. You know, there's some big ones, you know, that everybody's heard of, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, but there's cancer, and we're making inroads on all of those, but there are also a huge and growing number of genetic dis disorders where we now know the underlying genetic cause. And every single one of those cases you can make a huge amount of, of advance by investing time and effort funding in those areas, and we're not doing it. We've been flat funding research in this country ever since the Genome Project was completed. So, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. We have a huge opportunity now with the tools that we have. There's a tremendous opportunity to make new discoveries like insulin that will make a lot, a, you know, huge difference in the lives of, of our friends uh, and loved ones. And, and so I, I want to urge everyone here to get out there and remind your neighbors, your congressmen, everyone you know of how important this is. We need to speak with one voice. We need to step up, invest more money in research. It's going to not only make a difference in lives, it's going to create uh, jobs and, and opportunities uh, in, in a vital sector of our, ec our economy. So with that, I'd like to stop and entertain questions. Thank you very much.
We'll entertain questions for about 10 minutes. And we have three microphones with three runners. So they will bring you a microphone. And when you get the microphone, would you please stand? Would you please tell us your name? And would you please tell us whether or not you're a member of the society or a guest? And then ask your question. So first question. Would you please yeah. stand? Please stand. Okay. Oh, okay. Kenneth Rothschild. Yes, Kenneth Rothschild. Uh, no, I'm not a member, but I'm an associate uh, supporter. Okay. So when you look across species of bacteria and all throughout the animal kingdom and so forth and so forth, are there particular characteristics or strategies that enable a group to survive and go on, such as how often they procreate and their number of progeny and the adulthood and all that kind of stuff. And the end part, do human beings have enough of those characteristics? Well, you know, the time will tell. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the real answer to that. You know, like I said in my first slide, everything alive, alive today has that because that's how we got here. <laughs> Um, but not every species alive lasts for a very long time. And I think quite often what you see when you look at the history of life is that those guys that didn't last a very long time inhabited uh, some unstable niche that was taken away from them by something. Something happened. You know, climate change, for example. You know, it's, it's not a, it's true, just look at the fossil record. I mean, it's like, happens all the time. It's nothing new. Um, but bad things do happen, and then that changes. You know, I think humans are incredibly adaptable. I think we have a huge shot at being um, here for a long time. And if we could get off this planet, boy, who knows what we could do, um, certainly. So I, I think we've got it. We've definitely got what it takes. Um, if we can sort of get out of our own way, I think we have a very bright future. I'm not supposed to pick the next question so um, your title of the talk oh Tim you, Thomas your name I'm, and whether you're a member or a guest I am a member of the society and your name my name is Timothy Thomas I am going to ask Thank my you. question <laughs> hey. uh, your title of your talk uh, referred to immortality and it turned out in the talk that this immortality was of the germ line <laughs> yeah, uh, the individual uh, elegance uh, didn't have immortality. So I'm asking the question of, are there genetic mechanisms inside elegance that make sure it doesn't live? That's a great question. And um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, organisms, very few organisms are, you know, designed or evolved to to be incredibly long-lived. There are some interesting examples, like the call hug, uh, where you know, there's a lot of really interesting evolutionary biology that goes into understanding you know, the benefits of different lifestyles. And you know, that's not my field, but clearly C. elegans is not, uh, you know, has not evolved to be long-lived. It actually is, instead, it produces 300 progeny in three days, OK? So that's sort of the extreme that it's gone to, uh, which is great for scientists because we don't have to wait a long, around a long time for them to grow. You know, we can do a lot, you know, literally millions of animals in a, in a week. Um, but they do have an interesting trick they do. They, they have a dower phase where they can become this sort of resistant uh, little version of themselves and they can stay that way for months and maybe even longer. So they can live much, much longer if they do this. Unfortunately, they can't eat during that time because they have no mouth during the dower phase. They're their little resistant, you know, cuticle is really tough and everything. So they, they're really some interesting biology there because some of the genes that regulate the dower phase and extend the lifespan of these animals are also genes that are linked to longevity in humans. So there's actually a whole science of longevity in the nematode that translates beautifully to our understanding of human longevity. Uh, so we're actually learning a lot about worms from in that regard, even though they are incredibly short-lived. So, but that's a great question, and certainly an area that you know there's a lot more to learn about. 
Uh, hello, I, I held up my insulin pad. So name and what I, I did get recognized. <laughs> my name is Rudolf A. Krutar, and I am a member of the society. Thank you. I note that death was probably invented so that there could be evolution. Because if everything's immortal, there's no evolution. There can't be changes. Uh, also, when men were first landing, standing on the moon, I was giving a speech at a medical and biological conference on a program I wrote that would analyze the, fold, uh, the uh, secondary structure, the folding structure of transfer RNA molecules based on the base sequence. We only had seven base sequences for transfer RNA molecules, and my program correctly figured out the, uh, the folding pattern for all of them. And uh, how many transfer RNA molecules are now known? Okay. Uh there's a lot. I'd say 20 at least in every animal because there's 20 different amino acids and they each get charged with a different amino acid. I mean, each tRNA gets charged with a different amino acid, so there's many. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really hear the first part. I think your first part of your question was about uh, if things were immortal, then there wouldn't be any evolution. Um, uh, absolutely. I, you know, and, and I think that uh, it's, it's, again, it's interesting how um, the germline, of course, has to transmit information constantly, but the individual, of course, doesn't have to. Uh, so yeah, there's an, a lot of interesting um, sort of almost philosophical side to that, to that discussion. But you also said that you're, you're type 1 diabetic, I think. Type 2. Type 2. Yeah, so insulin, again, an important impact on probably more than just you. I bet there are other people who are using insulin here. Uh, Stuart, <coughs> Stuart Reuter, a member. Within the last year, I can recall an article saying the discovery of Neanderthal genes within the uh, existing human species. And I, two thoughts. One, uh, I met some people who I thought obviously <laughs> may have been in that category. <laughs> But the other is, how close do we have to have the genome to be able to have the activity that would create the hybrid to allow, allow the mating of the different, what we would call different animals? Hmm. Uh, not, it's not uh, my area. Obviously, a Neanderthal, of course, would be very, I think, um, similar genetically to modern humans. In fact, I think all of us have some Neanderthal DNA, um, according to the latest theories. Uh, so I think, you know, um, probably you would not, you might be surprised if you've met a Neanderthal. They probably, I, I, I wish they were around, honestly. Um, they, might, they might turn out to be gentle giants or something, and they've got a really bad rep. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. But, I, but you know, I'm, I'm actually Surprised not more people have asked because um, one of the things that CRISPR is allowing is the genetic modification of uh, any organism, including potentially the human. Uh, it's now much easier to do. Um, and so people are now um, able to genetically modify animals and plants much more easily than they could before. So there's an ethical consideration there. Uh, that we all have to. That's why it's really important that people learn biology because, you know, a l there's a lot of fear mongering, but there's also real ethical issues related to what kinds of genetic modification should we really be tolerating in the, for example, in the human germline. Um, so it's a lot of issues that if people understood the biology better, uh, they'd be better able to participate in that discussion. Back here. Um, Preston Thomas, and I'm a member as of yesterday, actually. Um, so just recently in the popular press, they are discussing that they have developed ways to add new genetic letters to the genetic alphabet. Um, I was wondering if that had any relevance to your work and if you could speak about anything that that might lead to. I haven't read those papers yet. I'm aware of them, uh, also from the popular media. Uh, it's interesting. I don't know yet what you can do with those extra letters because, for example, the ribosome is only knows how to deal with four. 
So, um, you know, it's going to be, it's interesting, definitely. But on the other hand, how practical is it really going to be? I don't know. I mean, uh, one thing I find frequently is scientists make the same mistake as everyone else. We overhype. I didn't do it. I didn't overhype anything. But <laughs> other scientists do that sometimes. Not me. I didn't do it. Um, no, there's some really great things going on in, in biomedical research. And synthetic biology is a really exciting area because now you can genetically manipulate you know, organisms in a way that none of us could even imagine before. Um, so yeah, it's really, really an, an exciting field. Uh, on the other hand, also almost scary in that, you know, you can do so much that I think the technology is outstripping even the awareness of society of what's possible. So if you have a question, hold your hand up for a minute so the microphone, people can see your hands. Right here. Um, hi, I'm Marie Burton, not currently a member. Um, I had a question for you about an interesting uh, metaphor with the, the operating system, RNA as an operating system, and the sort of spell check um, component of that. And I wondered uh, if the, um, well, we've all sort of suffered at the hands of autocorrect on our cell phones, <laughs> um, <laughs> sending, sending some kind oh, of aberrant, yeah. <laughs> aberrant messages. And, and I wonder if uh, that, oh, like a hypervigilant uh, spell check, as you describe it, uh, might um, tamp down some sort of important evolutionary um, uh, phenomenon like mutation. That's a great point. Very good. And, and also, uh, I think, yeah, a, a, an interesting trade-off because the more, the more um, conservative you are about allowing new genetic information to enter the cell, the, you could be missing out on an opportunity to have some great new gene that would make you, you know, ma I think a glowing worm is much nicer than a worm that doesn't glow, for example. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think you're, you hit on something. It is a trade-off. And in fact, I think that there's an almost, it, more likely an excess of genetic information exchange going on and that there's so many viruses and there's so many, uh, there's so much information flowing around. The animal is constantly trying to improve its ability to prevent information from being, entering the cell and, and it always fails. And I think the virus, it's interesting, the germline just has to be better than the soma at this it doesn't have to be perfect because viruses don't really need to get into your germline. They're just going to get into you and infect you and then spread. They don't need to go you know, through your progeny to your next generation. They'll get there. So it's interesting. It's like the two, run, the two people who are camping and the one guy, there's a bear, right? And one guy stops to put on his shoes and the other guy says, well, you can't outrun a bear. And he says, no, but I can outrun you. <laughs> so... That's how your germline is working. I honestly think that that's actually the analogy. So the germline has to be better than the soma. It doesn't have to be perfect. And even then, it's not really good enough. So the mechanism I showed you, I showed you a one that was glowing, right? Sometimes they glow. Sometimes we can get them expressed. And sometimes they're silent. And so it's an error-prone mechanism, which again, I think it's to the, your point, which is sometimes it could be good, right? And you've got... 300 progeny, right? Let a few of them turn it, have it on and a few off, and then you sort of have both, best of both worlds. That's how I think about it right now, but you've hit on a very interesting question. There is a trade-off here. Hello, I'm James Griffin, a visitor. Uh, I wonder if anyone has a constructive idea about how these RNA, DNA mechanisms, which evidently were very complicated very early, how we came from rock and uh, plus oxygen to that. I, you know, you're maybe talking about the first 700 million years after the Earth cooled, <laughs> right? How did how did that happen? How did how did the first living molecules organize? Um, and there's a whole you know, area of, of science that tries to look at that. You know, and there's some beautiful work that's been done, but, um, you know, those experiments may take millions of years to really do, right? So, um, it's possible, you know, some people have even speculated that the, the nebula from which our planet formed already had life in it, 
and uh, that there, somehow that survived the um, formation of the Earth. That's an interesting theory, only because the first cells appear so rapidly, uh, it's, it's really kind of hard to imagine. Um, there's not that much more time in the history of the universe, though, because four and a half billion years is a pretty big chunk of the history of time as we know it. Um, so, you know, there's, a, there's still a lot of time, but not, not that much. So I don't think it really solves the problem. That's a really fascinating question. How did life organize initially? And I think, again, I wish I, I knew more about how that happened. It would be fascinating. There's a whole concept of molecular evolution before the first cells, the molecules evolving. And I think that the first living things were really uh, mixtures of separate self-replicating entities that could each provide a little bit of functionality. And together, those groups sort of coalesced to form a functional unit that eventually became the first cell. But that, that, that is, it would be so wonderful to have you know, some way of looking at that, but we don't, unfortunately. It's gone um, from this planet. So we need to go out and we find should, other places. We we'll take one more question. I win. I had two things. What's um, your first name and what oh, are you? Elisa Wynn and I'm a visitor. Um, the first thing is it really doesn't matter if you have an immortal creature if they're very accident prone or they taste <laughs> really good. Um, but my question is, I assume that the relevance to this, to the study of autoimmune diseases and that and what's going on with those processes is, yeah, there's is happening? Well, you know, autoimmunity um, is what underlies type 1 diabetes, which my daughter developed, um, and of course is a major medical problem. Uh, and there's been tremendous advances in, in that area as well. Um, you know, the human um, protein immune system is remarkable. The way, you know, there's a self-recognition mechanism involved in the human immune system, which is truly remarkable. Um, your thymus expresses essentially every protein that is part of you. So your thymus is doing this, educate, it's basically educating your T cells and B cells so that they won't recognize self. In fact, if they do recognize self, the thymus induces them to, to die, so they undergo apoptosis and disappear. So if that process breaks down, then your immune system starts to attack your body. And we're, we've learned a huge amount about how that works, but it is, you know, if you thought my talk was complicated, you should have an immunologist here to talk about that system. It's really, really beautiful. It's fascinating biology. Um, and we're, you know, and there's a lot of interesting regulation that can go awry, and that can lead to all kinds of problems. And one, interestingly, I didn't mention this, but, you know, I showed you the bacteria getting infected. Uh, your body is covered with bacteria, everyone's body, inside and out. In fact, there's more bacterial genomic DNA around and inside you than, than your own DNA in terms of uh, sequence diversity. There's so much gen genetic information, all, it's all there. And, and there's a lot of the theories behind the sort of increase in autoimmunity and things like type 1 diabetes is partly because we've cleaned up our environment and our immune system, which was used to drinking water filled with viruses like the ones I showed you, is now drinking clean water and um, you know, not getting infected with parasites. And that's partly why our immune systems are going wild and, and attacking our own cells. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting biology there. It's really, you know, if, you're, if you have kids or if, if you are interested in uh, the, the sciences at all, it's a great time to get involved in biology. It's a ex really, really exciting time. So Thank I, you. I'm going to have one last question, which is to ask you <laughs> if uh, you see a re evolutionary relationship between the systems you've described and self. I'm asking whether there's, uh, whether Craig sees an evolutionary relationship between what amounts to an immune system and a self-recognition system in the case of of C. elegans um, and the RNA system and our immune system, and, uh, or do they, you think they evolved independently? 
Well, the RNA-directed uh, mechanism for viral defense is um, very ancient, and it's, n it's found in worms and plants and fungi. Um, and uh, recently, there are a couple of papers suggesting that humans are using their argonauts for um, possibly for immunity as well. We have an additional immune system, as you know, that detects the viral proteins, which is a very powerful type of immunity, which uh, works pretty well. Um, worms don't have that machinery, so they're really good at finding viruses based on their genetic information rather than their protein information. So it's just a different way of doing it. That's why I say you can learn a lot from looking at different organisms because they do things differently. It's not like one way is better than the other. It's just different. Um, and worms have emphasized that mechanism and uh, we've learned a lot from them in that regard. So I think there could be lots of parallels between these little uh, you know, granules in the germline uh, that we see in the worm and the flow of genetic information in the human uh, there are some in interesting examples of epigenetic traits that have been passed from, from uh, parents to offspring independently, apparently, of their genes. So, um, and this is in humans as well. So there's some interesting parallels, and I think it'll be really, you know, obviously it's much harder to unravel the, molecular, the biology of a human pathway in a human. That's why we study a worm or a fly, uh, because we can make progress much more rapidly. If you try to do it in a human, you know, trying to convince people to have progeny for you, or, you know, it's, a, it's, not, it's not easy. So, anyway. Well, thank you for a fascinating talk. Thank you. And before you go, I'd like to present you with this plaque. Thank you very much. Which is the announcement of your talk, signed by the members of the General Committee on behalf of all the members of PSW. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Don't go yet. There's a bit more. You can go. I can go. You can okay. go. <laughs> We're done with you. <laughs>